dear God, thank you for this time to come together um, and just learn about you. I ask that um, today you can speak through me and um, let all of us take away something that we can apply to our lives and um, worship you, Lord. Um, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so when I was in high school, I decided that I wanted to join a sports team. And the main reason I wanted to join a sports team at Fallbrook High School was because I was terrified of the PE locker rooms. I thought I was going to get beat up or killed or something. So I was like, I can't do PE, so I got to do a sport. But then I thought about every sport that there was, and I was like, I have no athletic ability. There's no way I'm going to make any team. And then I realized the cross-country team will take everyone. And so I was like, I'll join the cross-country team. You don't get cut from the team because they can have a team that's so big or so small, it doesn't matter. So I joined the cross-country team, and I started to work really hard, and I actually started to like running. I'm one of the few people in this world who enjoy running. Is there anyone else out here who likes running? Yes, fellow l runner lovers. <laughs> it's not a joke. I do love running. But as I got um, to practice more and to train more, I eventually got to varsity by my sophomore year, which was awesome. And there's this one race I want to tell you guys about for my junior year. It's at Kit Carson Park in Escondido. It has this horrible hill, and if you've ever been there before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Otherwise, you can go after today. It's a beautiful day. You can go check it out. So we get there to Kit Carson Park, and then the night before, we had loaded up on spaghetti, carbs, lots of water, and we're ready to get going. We're in our uniforms, so we head to the start line. And my team had a few rituals that we would do um, every every race. The first one would be that we would go to the bathroom because once you start that race, there's nowhere else you can go. So we go to the bathroom probably four times sometimes because we were so nervous and we drank eight bottles of water the night before. Then we would get on the line and we would do our warrior cheer. We would try to be loud and intimidate the other teams like we were tough, even though we we're all really small, skinny little girls who didn't look tough and intimidating at all. So we would yell as loud as we could. And then the last thing we would do is my team would actually sit, stand in a circle and then we would pray to God. Um, and I just love doing that at the beginning because we always reminded ourselves in the prayer that it's just a race, that no matter what happens in this race, um, it's not going to determine who we are. It's not um, going to determine what the rest of our life is because a teammate, a cross-country runner, was a title that was second to my title as a daughter of God. And so I love starting all of my races like that. So this one race, we get to the line and we're doing our strides, which is kind of like warming our legs up. And then it's time to go. So we get on the line. There's about three of us, and then it's kind of tunneled back for the rest of our team. There's about 200, maybe 300 people on this, on this super long field. Well, this field in about 100 yards, that's extremely long, goes down from about here, this part of the couch, to this part of the couch. It tunnels down. So 200, 300 people in a 100-yard sprint have to get through that tunnel. So I'm thinking, okay, got to do this, got to get ready for this. So we're on the line, and I'm looking around. And I'm looking for this one girl who's from Escondido High School. The reason I'm looking for her is because she's about the same pace that I am, but a little bit faster. And she's a runner who knows exactly what she's doing. She's trained. She knows exactly how to do the race because she's the kind of runner that she can get out at the beginning, and then she has set her pace to then weave through the other runners to get to the front of the pack and medal. And so every race, I look for that girl, and I'm like, I'm going to use her, and I'm going to go for it. So I'm on the line. We're getting ready to go. I find the girl. You lean forward in your stance. Everyone has different ones. Some people like want to get down, like all track-like. But I'm just like, okay, I'm going to try not to fall. We run. We start going out. You do a mild sprint, get to the middle of the pack. And as it narrows down into the tunnel, I get a flat tire by someone, probably my own teammate. I don't know who. And as I get the flat tire, mistake number one, I turn and I look at it. I don't know why. And then I fall to the ground down, I'm trying to get back up, and as I'm getting up, another runner, because there's a stampede of human beings behind me, steps on my back, and now I'm like this on the ground. So I get up, my shoe halfway on, and I look up, and I'm literally dead last with the entire stampede turning around the corner in front of me. So you know the first thing I do? I start to cry like a baby. I start crying. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, okay, just go. Just start running. So I'm like hopping like this because I have half a shoe on. And I realize, okay, that's not going to work. So I take my shoe off and I'm running as I'm untying my triple, quadruple knots because that's what you're supposed to do. And I'm running and I'm panicking. I'm like, this is horrible. This is horrible. And then I get my shoe on and I start taking off. And I have a pep talk in my head because cross country is really mental. 
So in my head, I'm saying, okay, just do this. You got this. Stop crying. Be a man, Shara. You can do it. And so I'm holding back the tears, and I just start going. I just start running. And I have so much adrenaline in my body that by the end of the race, when I cross that finish line with a bruise on my back, my ego slightly hurt from the fact that I cried like a little baby in front of my coaches and my other teammates on the sidelines. I had still had my best time ever in any of my races so far. It was my PR, my personal record. Because even though I tripped and I fell down, I pressed on. No matter what, I went for it. And I went to the end. And a lot of us can relate to sports. We can relate to athletics, whether we've been in them, whether we've watched them, or even just heard of them. And today, we're going to look at a story in the Bible that really gives us a picture of our Christian life as this race. This race that we're going through to the finish line. The beginning of the race, the start line, when we're born. The end, when we die. And it's in the book of Philippians, so let's open up there. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12. It is on in the right side of your Bible. I'm like winded, like I was just running in a race. Oh. As you guys turn there to Philippians, you can have a neighbor help you look in the table of contents. I'm going to catch you up from last week because last week's really important to understand what this whole race analogy in the Bible is all about. So last week, Scott came and he talked about the difference between religion and a relationship. A lot of times, some of us as Christians hold religion as more important than a relationship. We hold this list of rules, things we have to do, this task list that we can check off instead of the relationship with God that we have. And he's saying it's more important to pursue this relationship over this list of rules. So Paul, the author of Philippians, he says that. And then he's going to continue on what we're reading today and say how we do that. And I love that he gives it the, the how, how to list to do this in a race analogy. Because a lot of us can relate to that. It makes sense, a race, a start and a finish. Start, life, end when we die. And so we're going to read through this in Philippians 3, 12, all the way to 4, 1. And then we're going to go back through it so we can understand it. Because a lot of times we read the Bible and we're like, I have no idea what that means. And I want to make sure we understand exactly what this means today. So Philippians 3, 12. Not that I have already obtained all of this or I've had already been made perfect. So he's saying everything we learned last week about our relationship with God, pursuing that first. He's saying, I, Paul, this holy dude who's awesome, I have not obtained this yet. I press on to take hold for that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press, to I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies to the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious bodies. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends." So the first thing we need to understand about this whole race is why would I do this race? What is the prize? What do I get out of this? Kind of that motivation behind it all. Well, it says at the very end of this passage, and I'm going to point it out first, in, in kind of verse 21 and 4 verse 1, it's talking about how the prize is both eternal life and joy in the journey. The prize at the end of the race is both eternal life and joy in the journey. We're, as a Christian, when you run this Christian 
race, run this Christian life, when you get to the finish line and you die, you get there and you get the keys to your mansion in heaven. You have eternal life with God. And some Christians, that's all they want out of this life. That's all they want. They just want to tick it in. They just want that fire insurance, that safety to get in. But Paul's saying, yes, you get that eternal life, but it's so much more than that. That during this race, during this journey on this course, when you run the Christian life the right way with the right running techniques, you also get joy in that process. That no matter what happens, you can find joy. If you trip, if you fall, if you get stepped on, you can find joy. And I don't know about you guys, i rather have a joy-filled life than one just, just trying to get into the, the ticket into heaven. I want both. I want that joy and I want to get into heaven to have eternal life with Christ. So today, we're going to be talking about, okay, how do we do that? How do we live that out? What are the running techniques? What are the, the things that we need to know to run that late race? So we're not just that Christian who's just trying to get by and get into heaven, but we're that Christian that actually has joy, that has purpose, that lives differently, that looks holy in this race of life. So today, we're going to go back through this passage and look at the three, I call them running techniques, that Paul gives us. And the first one is back in verse 13. So go ahead and find that with me. It says, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So your first running technique, which is something all of us runners are actually taught in cross country to do, is to look ahead but it's to look ahead to Christ as the goal. Look ahead to Christ as the goal. In any race you're in, you have to be looking ahead. You have to be looking at the end. You have to be looking at the prize. Otherwise, you don't know where you're going. You don't know what the point is. You have to look ahead. As a runner, they tell you to be focused. Be set on that. Don't get distracted by the things behind you. Don't get distracted by the people who are around you. Look ahead. That's your number one thing you have to do. In my race, I got distracted by the fact that someone flat tired me, and I looked around, and it was a big mistake because I wasn't focused on ahead. I wasn't focused on the goal. And in here, he gives us kind of examples and ways how to do that. And the first one says to forget what is behind. To forget what is behind. And what that means is we need to forget about our past mistakes and our past struggles. Sometimes as Christians, we choose to live in those past mistakes and those struggles, those areas where we're filled with guilt and shame. We can think back of that time where we did something wrong or that time when we shouldn't have done that thing or that time we shouldn't have said that thing. And we live in this moment of guilt and shame and we choose to just stand there and live in it. We choose to be a victim in that instead of moving forward. It's not saying, hey, forget that, like clear your memory 100%. It's saying don't live in that move forward from that, from your past mistakes. Those don't define you. Because as a Christian, God gives you forgiveness. So instead of holding on to this mistake and this guilt and this shame, grab hold of that forgiveness and move forward. Look ahead. Another thing that it means by forgetting what is behind is don't live in your past success, your past victories. A lot of times we let our academic success, our relationships, how well we do in salt or light define who we are. And then we let that define how our race goes. It's saying, forget that. That doesn't define who you are. Christ defines who you are. Look ahead to to Christ as the goal. It continues on in verse 15, saying, all of us who are mature should take a view of such these things. The reason he says this is that there's different types of runners. There's the recreational runners, those who just run to run, and those who run to compete. And it's kind of the same in Christianity. There's a lot of Christians who just come to church. They're here because that's what Christians do. They believe in God because that's the minimum of all they need to do to get into heaven. But then there's those Christians who are pursuing Christ, who find that joy in Christ, that can't wait to have a deeper relationship with Christ. So he's saying here, those of you who are mature, those of you who understand that, those who run to compete, listen up to what you should be doing. Let us live up to what we have already attained. He's saying, you know all these things that you've been taught at church, at TNL, by your small group leaders. Now live up to that. Live in obedience to that. So when you look ahead to Christ as the goal, you forget your past mistakes, you forget your past successes, and you look ahead and you run in obedience. In Hebrews 12, it, Hebrews 12 it's on the back of your, um, your sheets. You'll be able to look through this week. It talks a lot about the race as well. And it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. 
the reason it says, let us throw off everything that entangles us. So in ancient culture, when they would have these runners and these races, their uniforms looked a lot different than what we have now. And a lot of their, um, like, shoes or things they would wear on their feet either had straps that would wrap all up around and get tied because you don't want your shoelace to, like, go on the ground and entangle you. Or their shoes were practically, like, nothing there. So when it says to throw off everything that entangles or hinders you, it's saying, hey, if you have sin in your life that you haven't dealt with or there's sin you're still living in, when you start running that race, you're going to trip. You're going to fall. It's going to be very hard to look ahead to Christ as the goal because you're going to keep falling over what's dragging you back, holding you down. So another thing when it says look ahead to Christ as the goal, it says don't keep living in that sinful past. Those who are mature, those who want to run to compete, What's the sin in your life that's entangling you? What's the sin in your life that keeps tripping you down in that race? You need to deal with that so then you can keep moving forward, so you can keep looking ahead to the goal. Because when we follow God's words and obey his commands um, that he gives us in the Bible, it's the best way to run the race. He doesn't give us his commands so he can trap us. He gives us these commands. He gives us these things to do so that we can have the best race possible, that we can find joy within the race. And I just love this word picture of looking forward, of a runner, like, with their body stretched forward, their arms out, like, ready to reach, grab the finish line. That's what our Christian life should look like. We should be there outstretched, ready to grab Christ as a goal, ready to grab him in a relationship. And the way we do that is forgetting our past mistakes forgetting our past successes, and moving forward in obedience. The second technique that we have in running is found in verse 17. So go ahead and find that there with me. It says, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. It's saying after you have looked ahead to Christ, you need now to look around for authentic Christian examples. In a race, the beginning of my race, I looked around, I stood on the line, and I looked for that girl on the Escondido team because she was a runner who knew what she was doing. She was my example, and I was going to follow her because she, she, she was that runner who knew what to do. Well, the same thing is true in our Christian life. We need to be looking around for Christian examples. And the reason it says authentic is because there's a difference in the, the Christians who are just going to church and going through the motions and the Christians who are truly living it out in their daily life. Just as the difference between runners who run and runners who compete. You want to look around and see who are those people that are really pursuing Christ? What are those qualities in them that are role models to me? A great way to find these authentic Christian examples is by seeking a mentor. How many of you guys have heard the word mentor before? It's not a commonly used phrase with people your age, and I really think it should be used more because you guys are the prime time in your life to learn, to grow, to form who you want to be. The decisions you make now are going to affect so much of your future. And sometimes we think, you know, I'm a junior high. I'm pretty cool. I know exactly what I'm doing. I don't need someone to tell me how to do this. Well, guess what? You've never been a high schooler before. You've never been in a successful relationship before because none of you are married. You've never gone to college before. You've never been married before. So technically, you don't know what you're doing because you've never gone through it before. So why not get a mentor, someone who's older, someone who's wiser, who's done it before, who can tell you, hey, this is what worked, this is what didn't work, and let me encourage you here. It's like having your own personal coach through life. We all need a coach as we're running through this race. So I encourage you guys, this is the best time in your life to find a mentor. Maybe that could be a small group leader. Maybe that can be um, a parent, someone in your life who can hold you accountable because you need those people around you in the race to be encouraging you, to be cheering you on, and to be telling you when you're going to fall because it happens in this race. It happens in life. In Hebrews 13, it says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. It continues in verse 18 and 19, talking about this looking around. And this part's really important. It says, I've often told you before, and now say again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their, earth is set, their mind is set on earthly things. They're saying, okay, find Christian examples be aware that there's people out there that you shouldn't be following, that shouldn't be the people leading you in the race, people who are selfish, self-centered, who their, their mind is set on earthly things. They're so focused on here and now and what they want to do rather than doing what God wants them to do. 
He's saying you need to be aware of that. It's basically saying people like that, the people who um, are enemies of the cross of Christ, are those runners who have like this stick on their head, like kind of coming out, and then there's a string hanging down like with a donut. Everyone loves donuts. And so they're running to get this donut, pursuing this thing, and they're never going to get it. Because it's, it's right, th- you're never going to reach it. It's just not going to happen. So people whose mind is set on earthly things, they're dangling that in front of them, and they're always going to be running and chasing after that. And it might even take them off the course because they're so focused on this thing that they don't even realize that they're completely off the course. So it's saying you need to be aware. Are you, are you looking at Christian examples that are focused on the donut in front of them, or are they focused on Christ, looking ahead to Christ as the goal? He's warning you, you got to make sure you know what examples you're looking at. And the last thing that has to do with looking around is because you have the title as Christian, other people in the race are already watching you. So you need to ask yourself, am I that person chasing after the donut or am I that person chasing after Christ? Because people are watching you. People are saying, hey, I'm going to follow them. I'm going to follow their example. So are you running to run or are you running to compete to win the prize? And the last technique we find in verse 20. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. It's saying the third technique as a runner in this Christian life is to look up, for heaven is our home. Look up, for heaven is our home. At the beginning of my race at Kit Carson Park, I told you guys that my team every time would stand in a circle and we would pray. We would look up to God first, realizing that no matter what happens on that course, no matter what happens if we fall, no matter what happens if we get spit on or if we get elbowed by that mean person next to us, because that's what cross-country runners do, no matter what happens, heaven is our home. So nothing can defeat what's happening. Nothing can bring us down. Nothing can pull us down. Nothing can make us stop from continuing on to the finish line because heaven is our true home. And when we have that in perspective, it really changes kind of the things of, in this world, in this life. It really reminds us that what we're going through now is temporary. It's just a teeny little bit on the fact that we have eternity with, life, in, with Christ in heaven. And we also know that this race, it's already been won for us. It's already been won by Jesus Christ who came and he died on the cross for all the sins, for all of our sins. It's already been won by him. So no matter what happens, we can look up to God. We can look up and knowing that heaven is our home and that's where we're headed. That's what's at the finish line. And when we realize that, it's not just, okay, I just got to make it there. I just got to make it there. It's like, I got joy. I got this. Yeah, you elbow me. You know what? That's okay. You spit on me. I'm going to keep going. Because you have that joy. You understand that this is just temporary. Because at the end of that race, there is going to be a trophy bigger and better than anything you can ever imagine. Your most favorite dessert. I bet you it's in heaven. And you can eat it and never get fat. It's going to be awesome. But something that's so important, though, is when it says the word citizenship, we have a citizen, when we were born, we had a citizenship. We could say that we're citizens of this world or we're citizens of heaven. And I think we hear that word a lot. We say it at church, but I don't think we really understand what the word citizen means. So I'm going to give you kind of an example. My husband is from Costa Rica, so that means he's not an American citizen, which means he cannot vote. He cannot get some of these benefits from like certain taxes and stuff, which you'll learn about when you're adults. Um, he can get deported if they want to deport him. There's all these things that him not being a citizen of America keeps him from doing. Well, when we're a citizen of heaven, when our citizenship is there, guess what? We get all the benefits. We, we get to be a part of this body of Christ. We cannot be deported from the family of Christ. Having a citizenship in heaven and knowing that gives so much hope and so much joy in whatever happens. You know, I can't get deported. I I have the benefits of being a citizen of heaven. I have the benefits of God being my father. So no matter what happens in this race, I'm going to keep going. So I want you guys to imagine that you're going to actually run this race of a Christian life. And that when we get to the end of the finish line, it says that we're going to get a new body. Well, why why would we need a new body? Well, I think the reason it's saying, hey, 
you're gonna get a new glorified body in heaven is because when we run that race of life, we're gonna run it so hard, sweating so much, our body aching in pain, maybe some bruises on us, on your back, on wherever, that you get to that finish line practically collapsing over it, practically crawling over it because you gave everything you got to this Christian life, everything. And when you get there, God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's a new body and keys to your mansion. That's the difference. And I think it looks a lot like something like this, this runner that I found. Check it out. that the first time I got a little teary-eyed and I think it's because I was a cross-country runner once but to see the determination the hard work that Mo Farah had the fact that he looked ahead to the goal he looked around to make sure he was not going to get tripped up by others but he was listening to his coaches his trainers as he kept going and he continued on with so much joy at the end that no matter what he kept pressing on what if our Christian life looked like that and at the end yeah he got a gold medal we get so much more, eternal life and joy in this journey. And so I want to challenge you guys today. I want you to identify which running technique is the hardest for you and take practical steps toward improving. Because when you're a runner, you have to train. You have to build endurance. This isn't just something that one day you're going to get up. I know this. No, you have to train for this. You keep working. You can always get better. You can always get a new PR, a new personal record. And that personal record has already been set by Christ. So I encourage you guys, look at these three things. Is it, what are you struggling with? Is it with looking ahead towards Christ because you're so set on this earth? Is it looking around that you don't have good Christian friends surrounding you or you don't have any mentors in your life? Or is it looking up where you need to realize that the things of this earth are temporary and that heaven is your home? I encourage you, train in that running technique that you need to this week. God, thank you for this time to come together. We thank you so much um, for all you have taught us and continue to teach us, Lord. Um, as we run this race of life, thank you so much that um, you've already won it for us, Lord, and we just get to have that joy in running it as well. I ask that you help us to build endurance in our Christian faith to persevere through no matter what happens on, Lord, happens in this race, Lord. We love you so much. Amen.